thank you for downloading the Start the Week podcast from BBC Radio 4. For more information, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. Hello. Today we're going to be looking at some of the puzzled puzzles buried in our DNA, how much of our behaviour is really inherited, and the story of our junk genes with the geneticist and broadcaster Adam Rutherford. And we'll be talking about an extraordinary man, Grigory Perelman, one of the world's greatest mathematicians, who was the child of a mathematician indeed, and is now a recluse and the subject of a remarkable book by Masha Gessen. But if genetics and maths inhabit a world of objective analysis and even pure truths, we're going to start ahead of Easter in the muddier, or at least more contested, world of moral truths. Sam Harris is a philosopher and neuroscientist who believes that morality should be governed by science, not the random rules of religions. In his latest book, he says that if faith is ever right about anything, it's right by accident. Lucy Winkett, a Christian minister in central London, has a rather different view of the good society. She's recently quoted a former dean of St Paul's, Don't imagine you're thinking when you're simply rearranging your prejudices. Sam Harris, let's start by looking at how um, you think science could reshape morality, because there has been a general view going way, way back, I suppose, even to, to Hume and the Enlightenment, that there was a proper world of science which was about facts and investigation and a different uh, part of the, the mind which was about morality and entirely separate from science. Yeah, yeah. I think this is a myth, this split between facts and values. I think it should be clear to us that questions of right and wrong and good and evil have to relate to questions of human and animal well-being. And because human and animal well-being is emerging out of the laws of nature in some way, in our case, we, we, to talk about human well-being is to talk about genetics and neurobiology and psychology and sociology and economics. These are facts that science can understand. That This is a domain of right and wrong answers. And um, and we can ask a specific moral question. You say, is it right to force women and girls to wear burqas, say, as they do in Afghanistan? Uh, now, to ask this question, any any sane answer to this question has to be spelled out in terms of human well-being. It has to, you have to have some argument that this improves uh, the relationship between men and women, that, that, that it makes more compassionate men, more confident women. And I think we, we can be sure at this point that the answer to those questions is no, it can does we? not. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 clearly, I mean, the, the, we're talking about a, a It just deeply... seems that al already you're, you're putting in values which are not necessarily science-based. No, but but you, you, can, you can discover what it's like to, 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 to live your life in a cloth bag un, under coercion and to be beaten or killed when you try to get out. I mean, Afghanistan has a 12% literacy rate for women. They have a, a life expectancy of 44 years. This is an unlucky place to be born if you're a girl. And the crucial piece is that it is not unscientific to say so. To, to say that it's to, to withhold judgment on uh, on this practice from the point of view of science is to pretend mm -hmm. we know nothing about human well-being. And that's not intellectually honest, and most, it's, it's a failure okay. of compassion. I would have thought most Christians, almost all Christians, and probably a very large majority of Muslims would agree with you on that point, as well as Hindus. Are there areas where science would propose a different kind of moral thinking which would surprise people? Yeah, well, but I, again, I think we should take a step back because... It is simply controversial to say that, that science can form an opinion about what is truly good and what is truly evil or right and wrong. This is, it is, it, this is generally considered a no-go area for science. Most people think that we are just evolved apes that have certain preferences, um, certain intuitions of right and wrong that have been drummed into us by evolution. And, and by, by virtue of their origins, they leave us with, with, with no contact with a reality that, that where we can make truth claims. And, and, I, and, be, I'm, and I'm disputing that in my book. And to be clear, you're also saying in your book this is not to do with the sort of simplistic argument that uh, we are genetically programmed and that therefore what our genes tell us to do is good or that, uh, you know, I've, I've spent sort of 700,000 years on the Serengeti behaving in a certain way. I'm programmed to be a hunter who just wants to spread my genes, etc. Yeah, and therefore, I can't be blamed for it. That's not what you're saying. Yeah, clear, clearly that's not the case. There are many things, many propensities that we have based on evolution that we are busily and, and wisely trying to mitigate or get rid of. I mean, tribal violence and a, an inclination to rape. I mean, these, these are things that could have very well had an adaptive advantage in the past. And no one would argue that they're ethical because they, they they simply don't conduce to human well-being. These are these are 
Um, uh, we have flown the perch that has been built for us by evolution. And obviously, we have to do this with the brains that we have by virtue of evolution. But we can, we can talk about human well-being and human flourishing in the context of science uh, and not – uh, this is not merely to describe how we got here. This is to describe what are the possibilities of experience given what we are in this moment. I can see that well-being is a, you know, is a useful concept. Flourishing is a useful concept when you're talking about moral choices. Um, but what about transcendence? What about the spiritual and transcendent values that many religious people would say are at the heart of their morality? Well, I, I happen to be uh, very interested in, in what's called spiritual experience, and I think it's I think there are these core experiences for which we historically have only had religious language, experiences of self-transcendence and uh, compassion and um, selfless love, which we should be interested in personally exploring and we should want to understand scientifically. But, but There seems to be an innate urge to praise, as it were, or to glory in a beautiful landscape or a relationship or whatever it might be. Yeah, and I think it can go deeper than that. I think it can be... The, the, sp the spiritual truths that lie at the heart of our contemplative traditions are deeper than loving a beautiful sunset or being in awe at the, sure. or at the, 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 the intelligibility of nature. But one thing I think should be clear is that given that people in all traditions have these experiences, Hindus, Buddhists, Jews, Christians, and atheists have these experiences, clearly – the, there must be a deeper principle at work. This is a, a propensity of the human mind. This is this cannot be a matter of Jesus really being the the truth and the life and 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 born of a virgin, etc. This 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 none of these experiences confirm the 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 dogmas and doctrines of the world's religions because they they are mutually canceling. They can't. If Islam is true, Christianity is false, and if Buddhism is true. Both Islam and, and Christianity bear absolutely no relationship to the nature of reality. And so there's a, we, we need a mature science of the human mind that, ha, that makes room for a discussion of the, of the most positive end of, of the spectrum of well-being. When I was reading your book, I was, I, I was sort of thinking about what areas of morality might be changed radically by science. And I was wondering about, for instance, what science is uncovering about the consciousness, the self-consciousness, the self-awareness of other mammals. Mm -hmm. For instance, would that be an area, the much contested and, and, and argued over area of so-called animal rights? Yeah, I, I think the moment you concede that morality is a matter of mitigating suffering and encouraging well-being, and uh, therefore it, it matters to what extent any given creature can experience these states. If we built a computer that we thought was conscious and could suffer, we would have moral, we should have moral concern for it. And if we discovered that pigs suffer our treatment of them much more than cows do, say, if this is a, a possible discovery we might make, um, all of a sudden our, our practices would have to shift or should right. shift based on compassion for the suffering of, of fellow sentient beings. One other area that um, struck me was the, the question of whether when it comes to um, a sort of scientific approach to morality, it's actually possible to analyse why we behave morally or we don't behave morally because a lot of people say yes this is all very well but it's a bit bloodless it's a bit intellectual and actually everybody needs um, cohorts groups communities um, to discuss morals and to police each other as it were or to look at each other and that's really how we take moral decisions we're surrounded by groups which may very well be faith groups well that, that, that's there's no question that that's the case and the the, my main concern is that, that our challenge now is to figure out how to build a, a global civilization based on shared values. We, we simply must converge on the answers we give to the most important questions in human life and, and converge on principles of politics and economics and environmental goals. And to do this, we have to talk about well-being in non-sectarian terms, very much in the context of our scientific understanding of the world. And, and it seems to me that religious denominational language – uh, is is not the piece of software you want running on your brain but in you, order to do that. But you don't you don't have, as it were, the chaplains and the priests and the organisations to go out there and spread a scientific view of morality. Well, no, but we have we have a uh, we have reason and we have on we have the expectations that we use in every other area of our lives for reason, discourse, and uh, intellectual honesty and. 
in my other books, I, I bemoan the fact that this breaks down when we start talking about the most important questions in human life, we, and people begin to invoke their their faith claims. So, for instance, I, you know, the President Obama is against gay marriage, and when asked why, he says, "My faith tells me marriage is between a man and a woman." Full stop. No, there's no burden on him to ever make an ethical argument about well-being. He doesn't have to have a story about all the suffering occasioned by gay marriage. He can just he can just end the conversation with a faith claim. I think that's profoundly, intrinsically divisive, and and at this point in human history, uh, dangerously dysfunctional. Lucy Winkett, if somebody says to you, "I I, I believe in this," or "I believe that," because I'm a Christian, and it stops there, would you consider that? Uh, unsatisfactory, and, and do you think that religious people do have a duty to to examine well-being and engage at the at the level that Sam is talking about? Certainly, I, I think that um, to to uh, the, the difficulty I have with Sam's point, and as much that I would agree with, and much of the criticism of bad religion, of course, you know, most uh, uh, logically minded sentient beings would agree with. I don't have any difficulty with that at all, and. I think it's the caricature of religion, of bad religion, as all religion, which is something that I would have difficulty with. That um, if if uh, Sam is saying we must converge on um, a set of shared values, I suppose one of my questions would be why, and is is that uh, is that uh, underlying uh, assumption of progress, moral progress, and underlying assumption to a kind of homogeneity of values, is that necessarily a good thing? Um, and and as, certainly as a person who would say, I'm a Christian, I would absolutely not uh, wish to stop there. I would, I would want to engage. I think Christianity uh, in itself, as with other world religions, has much to say about uh, the nature of well-being, the nature of human flourishing, the nature of what a society might be that we build together. But fundamentally, you would you would respond to him that there isn't a sing that there isn't necessarily a single answer to every moral question. Dep I, it depends. It depends where you come from. I think. I think. Well, I'm not. I'm not. I wouldn't say that. I want to. I would want to be absolutely rel relativist about it. But I would say that if there are if there are some shared values, they would be very few. And I, I, you know, it'd be very interesting to to take one and to see where it where it got to because I think the golden the, rule, yeah, I do mean, unto others would be a is pretty not it's not universal, but it's very very widely spread. Sure, I mean, there's two versions of it: either don't do to others what you wouldn't wish that they do to you, so the negative version, or more positively, do to others as you would wish that they would do to you. But I mean, from from a Christian point of view, for example, there's another there's another step that one would take with that, which is clearly Jesus quote that but it was already in existence Jesus of Nazareth then took it on one stage further and said do as I have done to you which is about washing one another's feet serving mm. one another and that notion of imaginative sacrifice and that's one thing that I would want to ask ask you Sam about uh, the the kind of notion of sacrifice and beauty and imagination in this you know moral universe and right. Are any other areas of human concern permitted at the table of discussing morality other than science? Uh, yeah, good, good question. I, th I think we should revisit this issue of well-being, though, because what worries me about religious conceptions of morality is that they seem to, to separate moral concern from a genuine and intelligent discussion of human well-being and human flourishing. So you take, for example, the Catholic Church. This is an institution that is more concerned about stopping contraception than stopping the rape of children. It's an institution that's, that's it's more concerned about stopping gay marriage than genocide. Now, I say this as a matter of both of its apparent doctrine and as a matter of, of its attentional energies in, in recent decades. And when you see that, uh, and when you see people go to sub-Saharan Africa and preach the sinfulness of condom use in villages ravaged by AIDS, or you preach or preaching this necessity of believing in Jesus in places where that have been war torn for decades with Christian Muslim conflict, you'll see that this this the concern of this institution is not tracking human well being, and um, it's just so then there then they appear to be pseudo moral concerns. Then 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 to my eye. The Catholic Church appears as wrong about morality as it does about cosmology. You're going to have to jump in and defend Catholics here as an Anglican. <laughs> well, would I mean I, I, I take the criticism, I understand the criticism, mm -hmm. but would you say that just because um, scientific experiments were carried out in the Third Reich in Germany in the 1930s and 40s, therefore science is no, no longer permitted to exercise its 
its if, its uh, effect no, on no. humankind. Well, you're, again, you're characterizing bad analogy. religion it, it, and making fa- it all religion. An- but let me. S- I hope I can spell out why that's a false analogy because this is. You can always. I'm not pointing to all the bad things that religious people have done as a sign of religion's pathology. I'm pointing to all the bad things that religious people have done and continue to do precisely because of the doctrines they believe in the name of faith. Now, well, so couldn't there, you say the same? Sorry, couldn't you say the same about the, 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 the scientists? The, in the, the, the Nazi Thurber? scientists? They thought that they, thought they were actually conducting experiments, some of which were very useful. Well, but but they, they were conducting experiments on people they believed weren't people based on a completely irrational, dogmatic uh, ideology of the German, you know, mm. the purity of German blood and and the evils of, of uh, uh, I mean, it's, this is not, that's, there's no, there's no society in human history that has ever suffered because its people became too reasonable, too demanding of evidence, too sensitive to dogmatism. I mean, this is, this is the lifeblood of science, and it is not the lifeblood of religion. Right. And um, before we end this bit of the discussion, I just want to ask you about one of the other areas in the book which uh, fascinated me. Again, I'm trying to search for how would life be different? if sure. science governed morality. And one of the areas that you look at later on is uh, the question of truth-telling and the notion that although we've got lie detectors at the moment, they're not 100% accurate or anything like it, but that we could, through brain imaging and so on, be quite close to being able to tell pretty much certainly whether somebody was lying or yeah, not. That, and I you think, think pu- public yeah. lie detecting um, in all sorts of situations. I mean, I'm thinking about politics, of course, as well. But this is something that would that could become acceptable. Oh yeah, I think when you just sensitize yourself to the cost of not being able to tell whether someone's telling the truth. I mean, there, there are people who go to in my country where we have a death penalty. People who go to their deaths in prison for crimes they didn't commit, and that, you know, DNA evidence is, has been exculpatory in hundreds of cases, but. It's often too late, and um, the, the, and then there are obviously people who who can bluff their way out of uh, cr- you know, war crimes trials based on successful lying. So, to be able to tell whether someone is representing their beliefs uh, honestly would be a huge boon to us. Uh, and I think non-invasive ways of doing this are coming. And and so I, I think we could, our expectations of truth telling when conversate when the truth really matters when. The lives of millions depend on getting really straight about whether people I love, are, well, I, are being I, honest. I, I think it's fascinating. It'd be absolutely yeah. fascinating to put a, if everybody had something strapped to their head and you knew when they were lying. It's a yeah. Vasha Gessen. Um, I want to ask you about the mathematics of scientific morality. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, history is full of examples of people making themselves and others unhappy in the in the name of the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And I say this as somebody who grew up in the USSR. Right. Um, how will we count this up in a world of scientific morality? Right. Well, it, it's a it's a good question. I, I would distinguish between answers in practice and answers in principle. So what I'm arguing for in my book is that there are answers in principle to questions of, of human flourishing, whether we can always get the answers in practice. And, and this is true in any domain of truth that we acknowledge is a domain of truth. There are an infinite number of questions we can't answer, but we know have simple answers. So how many birds are in flight over the surface of the earth at this moment? We don't know. We're never going to know. In any case, it just changed. I mean, this, but yet, there's a simple number that answers that question. So, it could be like economics. You know, is, economics is scarcely a science now. It's so the economic systems are so complicated. You can get Nobel laureates on either side of a question disagreeing about how to respond to a, a banking crisis. Say, lay all the economists in the world end to end, and they yeah. still wouldn't reach a conclusion, as somebody once said. And yeah. yet, no one doubts that there there are right and wrong ways to respond, or better and worse ways to respond that are that are constrained by the dynamics of the system we're discussing. And so, we're talking about brains. We're talking about the way world the events in the world affect them, how we affect one another through culture and conversation, and all of this is realized at the level of biology. Mm. Mm. Well, the level of biology takes us to uh, genetics and uh, Adam Rutherford. Um, So we're going to talk about that a little uh, for a moment or two. Um, Before we do, though, I just reflecting on the fact that Easter is coming up. Um, in St. James's Piccadilly, which is your church, uh, yes. you have um, a great parade outside with the donkeys and all the rest of it. But parading up and down outside your church, you also have, uh, you've seen the backwash, I suppose, of the, the credit crunch, because yours is an area with lots of hedge fund managers and bankers and so on, 
um, and more latterly protesters swirling around. So any reflections from that particular eerie, um, because you've got a very, very good vantage point. I mean, you're referring to Palm Sunday, which was obviously yesterday. We're in mm. Holy Week. Um, and I, I think the kind of... I suppose what, what we witnessed with that particular march was, in some senses, a secular ritual. And how, how do you express what you believe about the society that you're living in? These, this was a, a mass protest about a particular aspect of government mm. policy. And clearly there was a, there was a, a small kind of the riot on the side march, of The anti-cuts march, we that. should say, rather indeed. than Palm Sunday, yes. Yes, <laughs> well, yes quite. Um, and, and, you know, that there, there are ways in which um, it seems to me that human beings need not just desire ritual in and that that's where I would come back to the point I was making before about imagination I mean it may seem ridiculous to walk up and down Piccadilly with a donkey and clearly you know there's some there is some kind of element of, of humor in that and certainly some of the tourists were, were astonished at what we were doing at the same time those of us who were intentionally taking part in that ritual found meaning in that ritual it looks mm. useless and it looks it looks silly to some degree but there is something uh, countercultural about it about it and that is the point that a lot of religious people would make about the importance of there being a a, a physical community a series of um uh, plastic rituals, objects and, and colours and so on to back um, moral instincts. Yes, exactly. And I, I don't think there's anything wrong with valuing ambiguity, for example. I don't think that that means that there is something dishonest about a person who is uh, of a religious sensibility. It simply means that there is an element of humility in what we're doing because we simply don't know, mm. ultimately. We can't nail it down to the, to the last... Yes. Uh, to the last degree, Adam Rutherford, you're on the um, the scientific side of the of the uh, divide, if there is a, a complete divide. But you went through the Alpha course, didn't you? I um, did. Which is a Christian course to, to I, I suppose, to see whether you would be affected or converted by it. I didn't really suspect that I was going to be converted because I am a fairly strong atheist, but it was more to try and understand a very successful movement in in modern Christianity to convert people. I, I believe from one type of Christian into another. So yes, I did this 10 week course. It took up a, a huge amount of time. And at the end of it, I did come to the conclusion that the Alpha course itself is a pernicious thing, but that Christianity itself uh, inherently isn't. So it, Alpha represents so, a particular so well, branch it, it won you over a little bit, if, if not to its particular system. Um, but what about the argument then that um, in practical terms to actually uh, engage in the world in a, in a moral way, having a community, a group around you, as faith groups do and scientific atheists very rarely do, is a, not only a good thing but a necessary thing. That may well be true and certainly in being in church witnessing the Alpha course uh, unfold, I did see how people come together and begin to discuss issues which they consider to be Im important to them. They're, they're, you're right in saying that there isn't an equivalent atheist or secular group, but Sam is CEO of, a, of Project Reason, which in some ways uh, answers that call. Yeah, I, I, let me say I, I don't dispute for a moment that we need ritual or, or at least highly value ritual. We need sacred language. We need things to say when people die or get married that are not uh, 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 ordinary state. I mean, we, we, we need, we need a, um, there's profundity in, the, in life that has to be marked by special occasions. And this, it's a problem that the only language we have for this at the moment is language that is, is redolent with untruths about the universe. And we have to pretend either not to notice what these what these rituals actually mean, or um, we have to endorse things that, that I think are, are, we can't honestly endorse. I think that, that you're mistaking religious language for scientific language, though. I think religious language is poetic language. It's expressing truth in a different way. But, but not merely so. Not, you, you can say I'm caricaturing religion, but 50% of Americans think Jesus will return to earth to judge the living and the dead probably sometime in the next 50 years, and hurl sinners into a lake of fire. Now, if you're going to say that that's not your Christian Christianity, that's great, but but this is not a caricature. This is this is vast numbers of subscribers. I'm beginning to think we're not going to come to a fully consensual position on this. <laughs> so I think let's move on to uh, Adam Rutherford's programmes, The Gene Code, on BBC4. Um, this is uh, explaining to people some of the, uh, the puzzles and the secrets in, in, inside our genes. Um, and one of the things that you focus on um, early on is um, 
our connection with the very, very earliest sort of muddy splodges of life on the planet and the fact that we actually share genes with some of the uh, unimaginably sort of simple things bubbling in rock pools, uh, which are as like to the early beginnings of life as anything we know. That's exactly right. And when Charles Darwin came up with the, the theory of evolution by natural selection in 1859, he expounded this idea, which we believe it to be correct, um, is, is, is shown by evidence to be correct, that all living things are, are connected. Now, he had no knowledge of genetics. He had no knowledge of cells. Uh, he had no knowledge of the mechanisms by which inheritance actually works. Now, the really huge revelation that occurred during the 80s and 90s and, and the first decade of this century is that genetics, the study of DNA, has really shown exactly that, that he, he was right mm. in, in the absence of, this, of this, uh, uh, this knowledge about DNA. And so one of the things that we wanted to do is to look at the, some of the oldest life forms on Earth, which are called archaea, they're very similar to bacteria, and look at the fact that we share, humans share, around 200 basic genes with these bugs that live in hot springs in Iceland, which is a, a staggering fact. And complicated life started because an archaea gobbled a bacteria, or vice versa, I can never remember which. That's, that's what we think. So for the first billion years or so, starting about 3.9 billion years ago, we just have single-celled creatures like archaea, like bacteria. And then suddenly there's this enormous cataclysmic event which is, as you say, one, one very small microbe being absorbed by another one. And, and that, this is the hallmark of all complex life, animals, plants, um, uh, everything apart from bacteria and archaea. And w what it is is that we have these, these power cells in, in, inside our cells, which are called mitochondria, and they allowed the growth, the sudden flourishing of much more complex beings. Does that extraordinary explosion of complexity, which you discuss in one of the films, does that allow any area for religious amazement? <laughs> wow. Well, it is a true revelation, if that's what you're asking. But yeah. I think the, the, the key thing is, is that it's, it shows that evolution doesn't just work in this very slow, incremental process where we, we're just changing things very subtly. There are many huge cataclysmic ex explosions that, for example, one cell being absorbed by another or, mm. or huge doublings or, or quadruplings of our genomes, which are really significant events in, in propelling mm. uh, the, the variety of life. Another area which uh, is fascinating in, in, in the films is the qu question of junk genes, that such a large proportion of our DNA code has just been pushed to one side as useless. Yeah, yeah, although we're rapidly finding out that it's not useless. So I, I was mm -hmm. a genetics undergraduate in the 90s, and mm -hmm. e even then we were referring to areas of the genome which don't contain genes as junk DNA. And that, that is a sort of that's a, 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 a word that has continued and per, per, perpetrates through, through the language of genetics. We're rapidly finding out that it's really not the case. If you look at the big revelation of the Human Genome Project was that if you look at the three billion letters of genetic code that we have, only about two or three percent of it actually encodes genes. Mm. So you've got this huge sections of DNA, which... It's like a vast, vast book, only small parts of which are relevant or make sense. Exactly. And when we look at the bits that don't contain genes, the fact of the matter is we don't really know what's going on there. And for a long time, it was referred to as junk because it didn't have genes in it. But what we've found out in the last few years is that mutations within them can cause disease, for example, or that we have huge bits of these non-coding regions, no, no genes in there, that are shared with mice and with chickens. And if they're shared, then it indicates that evolution has a historical record of a kind? Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. In fact, all, every genome is a historical record because we have this shared origin which goes back to the first organisms 3.9 million years, billion years ago. And the, the other area which, which will take us on to what Masha Gessen's talking about as well is the question of hereditability because um, it's the, an, an endless and in some respects pointless argument um, how much of what we do is inherited and how much is, is caused by uh, nurture and, and education and background and so on. Um, but your conclusion is much more is inherited than we have traditionally thought. Well, genetics is saying that, but there is, a, there is a sort of problem, a conundrum within modern genetics, which has only really emerged in the last few years. And in the programme, we were really trying to update with, with ultra up-to-date research about what genetics is saying 
the, the problem is this, that we see when, when you look at people's genomes and you compare them across populations, you look at traits like height mm. or diseases which are complex like diabetes. And what you see is that only a very small proportion of the, in, the heritability of those traits can be determined by looking at genes. And so there was, the, there was this emerging problem, the case of the missing heritability is what it's been labelled as. Um, it's not mystical, it's not magical. We, we just don't know where it is yet. So if you take a, if you take a, a, a trait like height, it's, it's obvious that it's heritable. Tall parents give birth to tall children. But when we looked at populations and we looked at the, the genes involved in that, what we saw is that only a very small proportion of the genes that we could see, could measure, actually contributed to height. And we, we don't really know the answer to that. Mm. It, it all relates back to that 97, 98% of the genome which doesn't contain genes. Mm. Sam Harris. Oh, one of the fascinating moments in your documentary was when you went to India and you... Uh, looked at the cat, the, the influence of the caste system on the, the, the genetic mm. stratification of, of uh, the population, which I, I can't. I mean, I've been to India probably eight times, and it never occurred to me what a natural experiment was being performed there, and it was really brilliant. So I, I was wondering if you wanted to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I thought it was a really staggering revelation that, but because of caste, which is uh, marriage, on, marriage only within a social group, um, you, they have conducted, as Sam says, this experiment for thousands of generations where which is effectively inbreeding um and and it's what we it's what scientists do with mice and and, and fruit flies in the lab all all the time but i think uniquely on earth the indian population because of caste has these um has has these uh, these these experiments going on um, what what conclusion do you draw from what you know so far well it is there is a danger in it which is that you maintain uh diseases which are recessive which mm. are normally outbred um, and and we, we do measure that within the Indian population, within the subcontinental population. There was one particular incident which we, we thought was very interesting, which was that within one particular caste, the Vaisya, um, a mutation occurred, we now know, probably uh, 3,000 years ago, many generations ago, uh, which for 98% of the history of that caste had absolutely no effect. And then uh, in the 90s, some doctors noticed that Vicias, when they went under uh, uh, anaesthetic for major surgery, they didn't recover from a specific anaesthetic for a long time, which normally only lasts five minutes. Um, and geneticists noticed this, and they sequenced the gene that was interacting with the anaesthetic. And what they found out was that Vicias have this mutation, which, which mm. has no effect until the advent of modern medicine, until the application of this, of this yeah. uh, uh, anaesthetic. So now the first question they ask Vicias when they go in for elective surgery is, are you a Vicia? Mm. Mm. Fascinating. Mm. Well, let's, let, let's return to the question of um, uh, heritability because Masha Gessen's um, latest subject is the Russian mathematician Grigory Perlman, um, who won um, huge international acclaim for solving a conjecture or a problem. Uh, we'll come on to that in a moment. Um, but Masha, this is a man who, uh, born uh, like yourself in the Soviet Union, the old Soviet Union, where maths is a sort of a, a secret world almost, a, a, a place in which people um, who are otherwise outcasts in some respects because they're Jewish or intellectuals or whatever can allow their minds to roam as freely as their minds can roam. And... This guy's mother was also a mathematician. There is an element of which, which mathematicians produce mathematicians, whether for cultural or genetic reasons, I don't know. Right. Um, I think that uh, I actually say in the book that he was born to be a mathematician mm. uh, because his mother was, was a very promising young mathematician. She was invited to stay on in graduate school, um, which for a Jewish woman in the 60s, uh, was an extremely unusual event. Um, and she said, no, thank you. I'm going to start a family. Showed up at her professor's doorstep 12 years later and said, I now have an 11-year-old son who's good at mathematics. Do something. Uh, and the professor fixed him up with, with a tutor who took him really through the, end of, uh, through the rest of his mathematical career. He trained him to participate in the International Mathematics Olympics. Um, he really arranged his career. So, um, so this was, this was a, almost a, a designer baby of mathematics. Um, 
one thing that I also find fascinating about what he inherited, um, you know, his his behavior has been very odd, and uh, that's part of why he's drawn so much attention to himself, because at this point he's a total recluse. He lives with his mother on the outskirts of St. Petersburg on his mother's pension because he's turned down all the international prizes, including a million dollars that was awarded him for uh, solving the Poincaré conjecture. And the famous Field Medal as well. And the, the Field the, Medal. The, the Nobel right. Prize of math. He just right. refused to take it. He's pretty much turned down every prize that was ever offered to him, uh, and he's been offered all the mathematical prizes in progression. Um, and one thing that uh, his mother is also an unusual person, but not quite as unusual as he is. And, you know, the uh, as Adam, you surely know, James Watson, the discoverer of the double helix, has been fascinated with, uh, has been obsessed, I think, with uh, the heritability of Asperger's and autism uh, for about the last 20 years. And that seems very much in play here. Mm. Um, you Earlier on, you mentioned words like uh, training and tutoring and Olympics in re- relation to maths. And one of the points you make in the book is that maths is more like a sport in a sense of, 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 of tra- or tennis, training up the superstars with intensive rigour and, and coaching and so on, than it is like an intellectual pursuit where you sit quietly by yourself in the library. Um, not exactly. Actually, uh, competitive maths yes. is very much like a sport. Uh, there's actually very little overlap between competitive maths and real maths. Uh, very few of the kids who go through the Olympic system end up being math- research mathematicians. Mm-hmm. Most of them end up being applied mathematicians uh, or not doing mathematics at all. Perlman is very unusual in that he went through the Olympic system, and he's probably the greatest problem solver the Olympic system ever saw. Uh, and ended up being a research mathematician. The world of the maths clubs um, that you describe in the book um, is not only a place where people can go and and do something uh, pure, which allows them to kind of hide away from part of the Soviet system, Um, but it's also a very strange world, sort of um, almost kind of homoerotic male world where um, people idolise their tutors and go off hiking and so on. Right. Um, Right. it was started. Uh, I mean, the, the 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 foundation of the mathematics schools and the, and the mathematics subculture uh, it, it goes back to a very particular man named Andrei Kolmogorov, who is probably the greatest uh, Russian mathematician uh, of the twentieth century and one of the greatest mathematicians in the world of the twentieth century. Oddly, uh, he was more or less openly gay living in the Soviet Union with his partner of fifty years, mm. uh, who's also a mathematician. Um, and he brought to the uh, the system of children, uh, children's ed- education that he created um, a very particular sensibility. Um, it was um, sort of built on the ancient mm-hmm. Greek model. Uh, there was a great emphasis. Germanic uh, hiking goes on a lot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, hiking and uh, all sorts of physical culture, mm. uh, all sorts of exercise, wrestling. Uh, mm. And um, uh, at the same time, there was, there was a great emphasis on music, on, uh, on mm. studying the history of antiquity and mathematics. Mm. Um, it was very much a boys club uh, so Grigory, in this boys' club, gets more and more um, uh, advanced and famous and so on, and eventually goes off by himself to solve the Poincaré conjecture. Are we going to try to explain what the Poincaré conjecture is? No, we're not even going to try to explain. <laughs> <laughs> Quite right. It's, but it, it, it's, it's about the placing of points in a, in a complex system or placing uh, of objects in a comp no oh, it's not uh, even that okay let's just but it, anyway it's jolly difficult <laughs> and he and he solved it and he posted his solution on the internet um and uh, astonished everybody and since then has withdrawn and probably withdrawn from mathematics never mind in a, never mind society right um i think and this is what much of the book is about uh the way that perlman's mind works is that uh he expects the universe uh, and everything to function um as rigidly as uh, uh clearly uh as well as mathematics does and whenever he encounters a part of the world that doesn't uh function as he thinks it should he sort of cuts it off so um it's not surprising in a sense that he's progressively cut off uh, mm. everything in life except um, for himself and his mother. Mm. Mm. And you, he hasn't spoken to you, he doesn't, he doesn't give in to you, so you've had to do all of this through, through, through friends and so on. Um, in a way, that made the project more interesting and, <laughs> and more liberating uh, because when one writes a biography of a willing subject, uh, one is always beholden of the person's view of him or herself. 
um, which is not always uh, the most interesting or the most accurate view. Sam, did you get a sense in doing your research what percentage of great mathematicians kind of segregate on the Asperger end of the of the spectrum? Um, well, uh, Simon Baron Cohen, who's the the world's right. leading expert on Asperger's, has done that research and he's found that uh, in a disproportionate number of mathematics students uh, falls on the Asperger end of the spectrum. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's interesting to consider whether there are trade offs between things that we genuinely value. I mean, obviously, you don't want Asperger's, all things being equal, but if if the the utility of being pushed in that direction is the only way to disclose that kind of mathematical talent, uh, it's an interesting case of... Well, that's, of, that's uh, one of the points that, yeah, that, that Simon Baron Cohen mind, makes, sure. and I, I hope we'll be discussing this later on the, yeah. later in the series of these programs. Adam? I'm interested in, in the notion that he was he maybe had a, a, a mother who was, a, who was very good at maths, but was effectively hothoused into, into being the maths genius that you describe, because there, there, in a nutshell, is whether he was predisposed to being good at maths or, or whether it was a, a facet of, of him being hothouse. Which do you think? I think it's both. I think it's nature and nurture playing. We, we, we now, we're now told we can't say nature versus nurture. We have to say nature via nurture, <laughs> which seems to me to com- remove the entire excitement of the argument anyway. Scientists haven't really said nature versus nurture since the 70s when it became apparent that the interaction between DNA and the environment was very dynamic. Well, Adam, that's me well put in my place <laughs> at just the right moment because we have come to the end of our time. Thank you to all my guests. Masha Gessen's book, Perfect Rigor, is out now. So is Sam Harris's book, The Moral Landscape. Adam Rutherford's series, The Gene Code, is on BBC4 tonight at 9 o'clock. Thanks as well to Lucy Winkett, busy during Holy Week. She is rector of St James's Parish in Piccadilly. Next week we have got Greg Doran, who has recreated or helped recreate Shakespeare's lost play. Neil Astley and Nicholas Shulman on the power of poetry and reviewing all of them with a critical eye, Claire Armistead. But for now, thank you and goodbye.